Hello there, a uh, very good evening and welcome to Government in Transition. I'm your host, Eddie Lane. I'm joined this evening by former Attorney General, Alan Landalal, and candidate for the People's Progressive Party Civic, Sonia Farag. Anil, Sonia, good evening and welcome to the program. Thank well, good you. night to you, Eddie. Good night, Thank viewers. Good night, Alan. Thank you for inviting us to be part of your program. Thank you very much. Um, and good night, Sonia. Good evening to all the viewers and listeners of the program. All right. Um, I want to get. I want to cut to the chase and get straight into the program. Um, another day has passed, and uh, it seems as though, in the eyes of Guyanese, that we are in the same place we were yesterday and the day before, uh, because people have been anticipating. Um, since Saturday, in most recent times, to have a declaration so that this electoral process um, can come to an end. The Guyanese people will have voted on March 2nd. We are already uh, completed four months and we're in the fifth month. And we're still to have that declaration so that the duly elected People's Progressive Party civic government can be sworn in. Um, we are seeing all sorts of efforts to so not only to delay the process, but uh, some of these efforts are aimed at um, stymieing the process to such an extent that uh, maybe to have an, a declaration that is not reflective of the will of the people. Um, I want to start with you, Sonia. Um, we saw today another attempt at um, delaying the electoral process in the form of a court action being filed. I know the fact that this is before the courts, um, we are somewhat um, you know, subdued in terms of having two in-depth discussions with regards to the, the actions taken again um, by one person who is claiming to be a supporter, a private citizen, and a supporter of the AP and the AFC. I want your, 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 your opening thoughts with regards to where we are and all these efforts are delaying this process. Well, where we are is another uh, is another delay tactic, and I find it quite ludicrous that they continue to use and abuse the court system to try to legitimize something that is already illegitimate. Everything that they have been coming up with has been fraudulent, has been falsified, has been legit illegitimate. Now, they, on the 13th of March, we had a declaration from Mingo. That is the latest. Uh, that is the latest thing that they want to use. The latest fraudulent piece of document that they want to use and not only use that but actually create a fraud of their own again by adding 15,000 votes that don't exist that we have 15,000 ghost electors uh, I don't know which polling station in the world they came from it most certainly is not Guyana but uh, coming from the 13th of March declaration they want to use those fingers um those figures by low and by mingo now as a result of mingo making that declaration and that declaration not being transparent as it was required to be on the section 484 of the representation of people's act we were we had a consequence of the recount process now, in that recount process, as we know, that lasted for approximately 33 days. And those were 33 exhausting and lengthy days that we had to thoroughly go through the counting of those ballots and a process by which Lowenfield was part and parcel as the head of the secretariat who managed that process on a daily basis. The citizen that we have that filed this matter here, the, the latest citizen, because there will always be some private citizen coming, she was, as a matter of fact, one of the container agents for the APNU. She was one of the persons who would escort the ballot box from the container to whichever, uh, whichever counting station it was going to. And she also knew, uh, knew that Mr. Lowenfield, Roxanne Myers, they were in charge of that process. Low and feel on a daily basis had to uh, resolve issues one way or the other that went to him. So um, for him to come and now say that that recount process is invalid, I find that highly absurd. Uh, this not not to mention that the CCJ's ruling in paragraph twenty of the summary of the judgment of the CCJ's ruling 
paragraph 24, the last sentence in that, the last uh, sentence in that paragraph, the CCJ made it quite clear that the recon process could not be invalidated by any authority whatsoever. And by that alone, we are, as a matter of fact, by saying that, it, they are also saying that the recount results are the only results which are valid and which we will be used, which, which are to be used to reflect the will of the people. So I, with all that, I mean, Diana knows that this is just another tactic to hold up the process, maybe for the reasons that they have deals that they need to tie up, maybe for the reasons that they want somehow to find some sort of legitimate vehicle where they can have the incumbent, uh, they can have a declaration in favor of the incumbent, but that's not going to happen. I, I personally think that all of the declaration, and I've had a perusal of the declarations that I, I have seen filed today, and I find them to be wholly misconceived, frivolous and vexatious, to say the least. So I am... Um, those are my thoughts as it relates to what has transpired today and as it connects with what has been going on since the 13th of March. Alan, I bring you in here. Your thoughts on where we are. Eddie, <clears throat> the PNC, whose politics is known to be the politics of rigged elections, as the major political party in APNU, made a decision long before these elections were held that they will attempt to rig these elections. They made that decision just after 2016, perhaps. And what we have been seeing since is a series of actions all designed to execute that objective. So we had the unilateral appointment of James Patterson by President Granger as the chairman of GCOM. We had the attempt at perverting the national register by a new house to house registration process. And we had a whole host of machinations in connection with that registration process. Then we had that uh, attempt to take away from PPP's stronghold the number of polling stations. And then we had the elections themselves. And on or about, the f they realized that they lost the elections on the night of March the 2nd. And they have been hiding their statements of poll since and have been and, and, and having and have had have, have engaged in a series of actions thereafter to pervert the results of those elections. So they use Mingo to use a spreadsheet to give them some 23,000 votes in Region 4, which they did not earn to the ballots. And then you had them trying to go to court to stop the recount when we got Mingo's declaration set aside and the decision was made to do the recount. Then during the recount process, you had this long series of objections which they made, all intended to undermine that recount process. The recount process survived that and we have had a series of actions thereafter to, in order to prevent the declaration of the results generated by the recount because the results generated by the recount confirm the ballots in the boxes. This that you are seeing now is the latest action in that series. Stripped of its esoteric and political content, all that this action consists of is an attempt by the thieves to rush to the court to get the court to assist them to continue the thievery. I cannot put it in more 
crisp language than that. When one goes through the papers, it is not worth, the litigation is not worth the paper that it is written on. More than 80% of the reliefs have already, or the issues raised, have already been decided in previous litigation. What, in essence, the proceedings seek to do is simply to get Mingo's perverted declaration be part of the election results and alternatively get low and fields perverted results or report be made part of the declaration. Mingo stole 23,000 votes in Region 4 and gifted it to APNU. So on the one hand, they want the nine declarations made by the ROs along with that perversity of Mingo declared. If not, they want Mingo a uh, Lowenfield's declaration in which he stole 115,000 votes from the PPP. They want that um, Lowenfield's report declared as part of the results. So the action is intended to put as part of the results those two fraudulent uh, pieces of paper, Mingo's declaration and Lowenfield declaration. How these people can think and can persuade themselves that a court will assist them to continue their per perpetuation and perpetration of fraud is an indication of the insanity with which they are infected. I wrote an article a few days ago in which I articulated that the real pandemic in Guyana is not COVID, but is insanity. And here it is right here in these proceedings, they believe that they can get the chief justice or the high court to help them, to grant orders to them, to protect them so that they can steal the elections. Some of the orders that they want to um, get the court to grant relate to the fact that relate to that GCOM must have no power to reject a report coming from a perverted uh, returning officer and GCOM must have no power to reject a report coming from the perverted um, chief elections officer. In other words, the theory that they are pursuing is that these two election officers, a returning officer and a chief elections officer, according to them, is empowered in law to compile results that are fictitious and fraudulent and results that bear no resemblance and no connection to the ballots cast by the electorate. And that report and those fictitious numbers and those fraudulent figures must be declared as part of the election results. And the same principle they are arguing must apply to the returning officer. Now, any sensible person examining that thesis that they are advancing would realize that if that ever becomes the position in law, then we might as well abolish elections because elections generally and specifically will become a farce because you will not have an election of a government by the people, but you will have a selection of the government by either a returning officer or a corrupt chief elections officer. Now, that will never be the law in any part of the world. But that, in essence, what this court action is about. There is no court, and I say this with the greatest of respect, and I don't intend to prejudice or influence the outcome of any proceedings, but there is no court, none, on planet Earth, 
that will ever give its imprimatur to the level of thievery that is attempted to achieve in these proceedings. And those, Eddie, are my opening remarks. As we go on, I, we will examine the, the other aspects of the action. Thanks, Anil. Uh, thanks to Sonia. But Anil, when, when one looks at what exactly is going on here, and we see in, in, in Loin V's most recent report where he magically, or, or, or uh, yes, magically um, added 15,000 votes, votes of persons who did not exist. And when one look at the actions that are being taken, clearly this is an attempt by the coalition to maybe um, enter government on a technicality and not necessarily um, based on the ballots cast on March 2nd. Uh, probably I'll take you first, Sonia, before I go to Anna. Well, Eddie, I can't agree that they can ever go into government on a technicality because everybody, Guyanese, the world over, judges, the regional judges, everyone knows that every action that they have filed so far has less than 0.1% chance of, or has any merit whatsoever, you know. And if they think that, it come, that by coming with, the, with this action with 28 or how, much, how many ever declarations that they're asking the court for, and the court is going to facilitate that and grant that, I think that, and again, I, I, I will have to endorse Anil here. I'm not trying to, to prejudice the court or I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the court or preempt what the court will do. However, having a legal a look at that from a legal uh, point of view, I can't see how those declarations will, I can't see how, how they don't have any merit. I can't see that the court will endorse them. I can't see that the court, well, I don't want to say the word endorse. I can't see that the court will grant those declarations. And therefore, I don't think that they will be able to go into government on a technicality, so to speak. But they continue to use whatever means they can or they feel that they can to, as I said, delay the process or to delay the rightful uh, the election of the right the, 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 what who we know to be the truthful the, the true winner of the elections that is Dr. Irfan Ali it is to prevent that that's one it is to whatever personal interest they have it's to tie that up and or if by some some magical way they can to get the a declaration for the incumbent filing these actions will not do them any good. It will not get them to where they want to be. So if they think that they can undermine the entire recon process, have all of the ballots uh, just be wished away and, uh, and, the, and the will of the people be wished away, that is not going to happen. I don't see that happening at all. Thanks, Sonia. Anil, I, I bring you in here. Eddie, uh, permit me to part company with you and my learned friend and beloved comrade. Um, Sonia, when you, when you both say, or you, you both use the adjectival description of the word technicality to describe <laughs> what is expressed in these proceedings. This is well, not you know, Anil, I'm not, Anil, I'm not cutting you. I'm not cutting you. But night before last night, when I was on the program, I asked Eddie specifically to come up with a new vocabulary <laughs> because we have run out of ad ad adjectives completely. Yeah. The technicality is a decent, acceptable, legal terminology and an English, an expression in English language that describes a, a, a particular state of skill that is required to be employed to succeed in a particular or on a particular issue or in relation to a particular uh, pursuit. My brother, to elevate what I am reading or what I have read here and to put it in that category is, is simply not, 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 not correct. This here is raw, naked, crude, vulgar fraud. This is another bareface, shameless attempt to thief 
even stealing songs a little too sophisticated to describe what is manifested in this action. And that is why I keep saying that this is an expression of complex lunacy for them to think that they will get judicial approbation, that they will go to a court of law, not an institution that supports thievery, but an institution created by the law to punish thievery. They go there to seek endorsement and seek support. You get the picture of the level of the insanity to which I'm referring? So this here, as I said, is not worth the paper that it is written on. My only problem is that, you know, judges have a duty to engage and embark upon due course. And the rules of natural justice uh, requires, require certain facilities to be extended irrespective of the type of litigation that the court is confronted with. And it is only for that reason that a court will entertain this so as to afford a hearing to the parties who are in, involved. The other major component of this legal proceedings is that it seeks to attack, invalidate, and impugn the entire national recount process. Now, we know that uh, Mr. David Granger, and we must go back to that CARICOM statement of Prime Minister Mia Motley. The very first sentence says that upon the initiative of President David Granger, the leader of the opposition and the president have agreed to a national recount of the ballot. Must go back and read it. Upon the initiative of David Granger. Today, I call him a sanctimonious gangster and he issued a statement rejecting my description. But I am giving him and the country another example as to why he is a sanctimonious gangster. Because he entered into that agreement and when the agreement was going to be given effect to his three commissioners at GCOM declared war upon the agreement. Then he got his minions to run to the high court as they have done here again in the name of Yolita Moore to try to stop that recount from taking place. And in a long line of litigation, started in the high court and ending in the court of appeal, one of the live issues that the court had to examine and rule upon is GCOM's power, GCOM's legal authority to conduct such a national recount. Because that is why they went to the court. They went to the court for, to get injunctions to restrain that recount from taking place. One of the grounds upon which they premised their action was that the recount process would have been supervised by CARICOM and not GCOM. However, the fundamental and kernel of their challenge was uh, that GCOM did not have the power to conduct a national recount. The same argument that the declarations from the ROs must prevail. Go back and check the reliefs, the identical reliefs that they are claiming now. Justice Holder ruled upon the matter. Then Justice George and then somebody else ruled upon the matter. And then the Court of Appeal 
The matter went to the Court of Appeal. And on the fourth day of May, I remember that distinctly. It was a Sunday morning, a Sunday at 11 o'clock. The fourth day of May, the Court of Appeal delivered its written ruling. Two different judges, I believe, gave a ruling. All three judges give different rulings. But they all said, they all concluded that GCOM had the power or has the power to conduct the national recount exercise in the manner that it was contemplating doing it. The only objection or um, reservation expressed by the court was that the process must be supervised by GCOM and not CARICOM or CARICOM team. And, it, and the chairperson, to her credit, put the recount process on hold for the purpose of the ruling of the Court of Appeal. As I said, that ruling was delivered on the 4th of May. The 5th of May was a national holiday, arrival day. And on the 6th of May, after the Court of Appeal would have given its clearance, then the recount proceeded. Then in Eslin David, again, part of the issues that were raised in Eslin David touch and concern the legality of the recount and whether it was ultra virus, whether it was illegal, whether the recount order was ultra virus and inconsistent with the constitution and the CCJ and those who wish to verify it for themselves, Sonia spoke to one paragraph. But anyone who's listening to me, you can go to the website. You can go to the website of the CCJ and look at paragraph 38 and 39 and 40. Those are three paragraphs. They span over a nearly two pages, one side of a page and the other side of the other page. And in these two pages, the CCJ examined the entirety of the recount order, its purport, its nature, the language used, the intention of it, its processes, how it was executed, its level of transparency, its level of participation by all the parties, the fact that it was a broadcast, the fact that it was um, uh, aired on live, live television, live stream, and concluded that it satisfied all the basic requirements of the law. There is not a single statement in this entire judgment other than one remark that some, some aspect of it may have collided somewhere. But of course, that did not invalidate anything. The court in its complete analysis, in my view, gave its imprimatur and endorsement to the recount process. So all these issues that they are now raising to question the legality of the recount process would be in law res judicata. As Sonia pointed out, in the summary, the court said that the results must be used. Anyone who looked at the video, anyone who looked at the video of the matter being heard and the type and nature and quality of the questions which were being asked by the court, can't form any view that the recount process was in any way knocked down or rejected or undermined or invalidated by the court. In fact, the court said, it set aside Low and Field's report. Why do you think that? Because Low and Field report did not comply with the expectation of order number 60 of 2020 that Lowenfield took upon himself to invalidate votes 
and that order number 60 never present him with that power and did not even present GCOM with that power. All of that, the court went through. So that is why I am saying to you that this thing here, hogwash, got greater value than what is expressed in this document. And you know what hogwash is, Eddie? You're from Essequibo. I see Sonia last laughing. <laughs> she knows that too. <laughs> so there is no way in a day or a year that this will succeed. The only sad thing is that they have given themselves another, I don't know, a couple of weeks more in office to plunder the treasury, to suck the blood of the Guyanese people. They will get another month's salary. They will get another month of allowances. And that's what this is about, you know. I mean, I have said that they are mad. And I hold steadfast to that view. I don't, I don't think in their, perhaps, I don't know. Mad, I don't know. Whether they believe that they can win these things. But I believe these things are largely driven by their desire to simply spot and suck the blood of the Guyanese people as they continue their parasitic existence. Because I, 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 I mean, they must know that this will come to an end. The judiciary, and that is, and that is the other thing I want to explain quickly. I know, I know Sonia needs to speak. The, the thing is that, um, and I want the Guyanese people to understand that this, at the end of the day, is a legal process. And people are impatient, I know. I am impatient. I am fed up. I am frustrated. All of us are. I understand the mental anguish to which we have been subject. But this is the last hurrah. This is the last train. There is no other train left leaving the station after this. And that is why in, in answering this legal process, we have to ensure that we canvass all possible issues. Whatever they are in doubt about, we must be able to extract it and put it before the court. So that when there is this final ruling, it's all gone in. After that, it is to take the struggle to a different level if they come, continue to come out, uh, refuse to come out. We simply have to go to another level because you can't deal with them in this way anymore. And that is where the conclusion of these proceedings will leave us as a people and as a country. But, thanks, Anil. But the, the issue that we face on a daily basis, because when one trace back the actions of, 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 of the AP and UAFC cabal, um, even as far back as March, as, as December 21st, uh, 2018, you find that they are consistently changing their narratives um, and they're consistently trying to find uh, loopholes, trying to find uh, diversions to ensure that things go their way, so to speak. Um, I mean, Sonia, where do we go from here? I know Anil is saying that this may be the last straw. Um, and you did recognize that the Guyanese people are indeed um, fed up, they're impatient, they want this to be over. How do we go from here? Or where do we go from here? Because it seems as though their only objective in all of this is to stretch their time in office despite knowing the inevitable. Well, Eddie, I do think that it will come to an end. It just takes another couple of days and a, a lot more patience that we have to exercise. And um, you're right, where do we go from here? The inevitable will happen. Dr. Panali will be sworn in. I do believe that the chairwoman will make the right decision at the end of the day. Uh, now we're faced again with another court battle. It's yet to be, we are yet to see what happens with it tomorrow. And um, then we know how we're moving from there. Uh, you know, I, I, I would go so far as to say I'm hoping that it gets thrown out tomorrow for all of the um, the for all of the frivolous uh, declarations that they're asking for. But again, we will wait and see. But you know what? They're hoping things go their way. But what is their way? Their way is the wrong way. It is the wrong way. It's left. 
everybody else is going right. And at some point in time, everybody, the, the, they will be left where they're going left and everybody else will be right where it will inevitab inevitably end up into a declaration that reflects the will of the people. That is that the PPPC has won. So, you know, it's just a matter of exercising. I know we keep saying that every day, that tomorrow it's going to come to an end or everybody's hoping that tomorrow it comes to an end. But, you know, exercise a little bit more patience because um, as we know that they, we knew that they were going to try every, try to pull out every rabbit they had out of the hat, every rabbit. So this is just one of those times that we have to do exercise a little bit more patience just to get to that end. Eddie, you, today I want to refer back to this, uh, the statement issued by the office of the president in relation to my earlier statement, labeling Mr. President a sanctimonious gangster. But again, I want to, to point of what a gangster, sanctimonious gangster he is. You will see tomorrow, this, as Sonia pointed out, this young man, is a young man or a young lady? A young lady, it's a young lady. It's a lady. It's a, it's a woman. What's the name of it? Messenger? Jones. Messenger. Messenger, messenger Jones. <laughs> he carried a message. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. The man named Messenger Jones, brother. Is that me? Is that me choosing? It's a woman. Is it's a, woman. <laughs> a woman. Okay. Well, the woman named Messenger. So the woman bringing a message. Yes, She's good. a messenger. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, as Sonia pointed out, Messenger Jones happened to be working for Apnu during the recon, right? And the sanctimonious gangster will tell us he has nothing to do with this. Uh, what this action is about is to interfere with the constitutional functions of an independent constitutional body in violation of the constitution. But a sanctimonious gangster don't want anybody to say that he's violating the constitution. He issued a statement today to say that he's not violating the constitution. And then he get his messenger, he, he sends his messenger to the court to do exactly no that. No pun intended. No pun intended. Violate the constitution. <laughs> no, they can take whatever pun they want. I don't know. <laughs> Now you will see tomorrow, you can see the usual suspect. Of course, Mayor Roberts, he's a front man. You can see the usual suspects, Rice Dale Ford. He had to appear on a camera suddenly. And you can hear he's part of the team. You will see um, Basil Williams in his mask, in his office by himself. <laughs> he will be a party. You can see the constellation from the Twin Island Republic will resurrect itself. Right, and then you will see all the usual suspects, the two clungs on the um with the two masks that does that running commentary on AP and UM. <laughs> um, I prefer to call them butter butter no castillo. <laughs> and you're gonna see all the APNU supporters gonna suddenly embrace this action. But the sanctimonious gangster wants us to believe that he has nothing. Nothing to do with this. And that is the level of delusion about which I'm speaking. And of course, it is being now being manifested in the streets because they're pulling Claudette Singh's coffin, now I'm told, all around Georgetown. They got a little square box with a doll in it. And they said, that's Claudette Singh. And they're pulling the lady um, thing along it. That is the kind of madness. And it's not the first time they're doing this. This is part of their political ritual. In 97, they, I remember distinctly, they did that when Comrade Janet Jagan won the elections. They had all kinds of voodoo and obia business going on in front of the courts because they went to court then too. And in their burning and looting and so on, they had all this voodoo and zombie business going on. They have started with the same level of craziness again. But I suppose that that's a burden that we Guyanese have to live with. Because I don't know how you deal with this. I, I can't deal with that kind of extra-legal um, masquerade 
that is going on in the streets. But, you know, I, I, believe, I, I, I guess they can say that they have won in the sense that they have given themselves a lot of month's salary and all the prags and, and porks, you know, that the office carries. And remember, Nagamutu is the one who used to talk about porks and privileges. Well, he gets one more month to live in the Prime Minister's house, to live in Mark Phillips' residence on Main Street. So I guess he will enjoy that one more month. And, um, you know, the others are going to enjoy until, I don't know. But what I want to say is that Kanu can never bore punt. Right? Kanu can never bore punt and will never bore punt. Evil shall never triumph over good. And every day that they take from a PC government, we are going to take it back. So they took six months. We will stay in government. Time will only begin to run Sweet. when Irfan Ali is sworn in. Right? And we will stay our full time in the government. And beyond that, because I, I, I can't see them redeeming themselves that they will have a support. No, no, no of course. Come That's 2025. A That's so. a given. I mean, before the next election. Um, but both Anil and Sonia, they, you raised the point, Anil, about what is happening in the streets. Um, and we're seeing the fear mongering manifesting, um, whether on individuals, um, attacks on individuals. We've seen what happened with CARICOM leaders what happened with the OAS, uh, the Commonwealth, and every single person who would have spoken out against um, the Granger Cabal's attempt to rig this election. Um, and it's getting worse, where they have now been allowed, and I think the, the Guyana police force um, is not acting in terms of dealing with these people. You have the COVID measures, the COVID-19 measures in place, but they're allowed to gather in large numbers. And recall what happened to uh, Neil Kumar and the others who were uh, peacefully protesting outside of the Ministry of Foreign, Foreign Affairs. Um, do we anticipate this kind of behavior um, maybe go on uh, or, or even um, intensifying in coming days? Because clearly uh, it will end one way and that is the People's Progressive Party so they being declared the winner. We saw, we saw the army meeting with the international community and pledging its, rather reiterating its pledge to uphold the constitution of Guyana. And we hold the Guyana Defense Force to that constitutional duty and role. We met with a high level team from the Guyana Police Force led by the commissioner himself and we have gotten from him an undertaking and a commitment of a similar type i have sent upon uh, upon his agreement at that meeting i have sent several um postings from the social media racial racist rantings, threats of various types, and I have not received a response from the Guyana police force. We were told that I must send it and it will be forwarded to, the, to a cyber crime unit. I have sent many, some of my, um, some of the documents that I have sent, I, we released it to the press. We have not heard anything or we are not um, informed of any action by the police the police force must understand and the institutions of state including the public service the gra and all the state institutions that they are not politicians stay out of politics and discharge the responsibility of their office if they play politicians who are holding this country hostage and who are engaging in these acts of 
national destruction and are destroying the fabric of our country, they will be held responsible and appropriate actions will be taken against them at the appropriate time. Those who are not politicians, but are in the state apparatus, but who wish to play politics, they will be visited with the same treatment. Because that is, the, that is what the law says. Not me. That is what the law demands. Stay in your corner, do your work, and nobody have a problem with you. This is a political battle where one side wants to thief a government. And we have to defend that. And the international community have been with our been on our side. And really, I will end here on this issue, Eddie, by saying that if ever there was a time for the sanctions to begin to be imposed that we heard so much about, there is not a better time than now. It must begin now or the people will begin to lose confidence in those who are threatening these sanctions because they will conclude that it is a mere bluff and a puff and law-abiding citizens are going to lose respect and hope and confidence in those people and institutions. And the miscreants are going to become more emboldened. So from both perspectives, we will lose corn and husk unless these sanctions come now. So your thoughts. All right, so what I have recognized is that it's just, uh, and I'm echoing probably a lot of uh, sentiments from a lot of people here. Uh, it's really just what their tactic has always been, who their, what their nature is, and that is bullyism. They feel if they take to the streets, and I have taken note that their support base has decreased considerably since the um, elections to now. And of course, that would be, I, I, I'm hoping that that means that a lot of people are seeing that what they're doing is completely wrong, completely against the rule of law, completely against humanity. And um, I've taken note of all of that. But I've also, yes, taken note. And again, I'm going to echo the sentiments of a lot of people out there that the police force is, doesn't seem as forceful when it comes to the protection of its citizens when the AP and new AFC uh, supporters are out there on the streets and um that is something to seriously consider and uh, as anil would have said the new chief of staff would have given an undertaking that he would uh, abide by the law and he will execute his duties as he has taken an oath to do and uh, i'm going to hope that he does that I mean, we're not seeing a lot of that with all of the gatherings that we have out there and persons not being arrested, persons are not being, um, they, they, they're, not, they're not exercising what they would have exercised uh, previously with the, when the PPP supporters were out there. And um, I think the only thing is, yes, now that we have, a, we have an international support that is so strong that the international community will also exercise or put their foot down when it comes to uh, implementing sanctions and I also agree that there would be no better time than now than to do so because that will actually uh, that will actually say to the guy to the to those persons who think that it's a bluff that look this is the real deal I need to back off I need to get out of the tyrannical behavior that I'm getting that I'm getting on with so that's that's pretty much what my thought is on what is going on. Um, I, the, the final issue I want to address as we, we head to our wrap up time is that of Lowenfield and um, Lowenfield has been continuously, and you, you spoke to some of his transgressions earlier, um, but he has been continuously flouting the laws, 
continuously um, ignoring the instructions of the commission uh, through the chair, uh, but still remains on the job. I know there has been a motion before the commission to have him removed. Um, he was given another chance today uh, by the chief, by the, the chair of the commission to, to, to redeem himself. Again, he failed to act. Um, your thoughts on Lo Nguyen remaining on the job and clearly seems he has no intentions of, of obeying the instructions of the chair. The GCOM is an independent body, as we all know, and GCOM has the right to treat with its officers as it sees fit. I, again, would confirm that GCOM has the power to, so to dismiss him summarily, and I have repeatedly called upon GCOM to do so. GCOM has not done so. As a citizen of Guyana, speaking about his conduct as a chief elections officer, a public officer, a statutory officer. I don't think in the history of Guyana and possibly in the Caribbean, any other public officer has acted in a most disgraceful, dishonest and degrading manner than Keith Lowenfield. History will record him in that light for the rest of his life, unfortunately. And I feel not for him, I feel for his family. He will go down in people's mind as a rogue and a vagabond. Whatever is going on in his head, I don't know. But the man is irredeemable irredeemable and has no place in a public office anymore. No place. At the appropriate time, the relevant authorities will examine his conduct and they will have to deal with him in accordance with the laws of the country. That will be done at the appropriate time. If only to illustrate and demonstrate for the purpose of the future that this kind of conduct must never ever be countenanced or tolerated in our country ever again. Not only at GCOM, but in any public office in this country. Um, so that's how I'll answer that question. Uh, Sonia, um, your response to that, as well as your closing thoughts, we have just a few minutes remaining. Well, what I, I'm quite, I must say, I'm quite disappointed that the CEO was not dismissed at yesterday's meeting, because I think the constitution, not I think, the constitution at article 161A gives the commission the power to remove him and discipline him but and also he's been continuously defiant in his conduct he has been given specific instructions he has re he has completely defied those instructions he has acted in gross insubordination and he there are there are strenuous grounds for him to be removed so i was quite disappointed that he was not removed but you know eddie this must be one of those ropes that has it probably ha has a couple more inches to go, but even the longest rope has an end. So let's just let's just say I said it the other night. I'm going to say it again. Let's just say that they let's just hope that the chairwoman is giving him a very long rope to hang himself. So because that is all that is all that I can see. As Anil would have said, it's his it, his conduct has been completely disgraceful, disrespectful. He has completely dishonored Diana. We still have to pull ourselves out of that in terms of the international, what, how the international community views us. And um, it's very unfortunate that we have one man who is the CEO for the Elections Commission that can hold this entire country at hostage after the people have spoken. I can't, I, I'm sure there's a stronger word than unfortunate, but unfortunate is what I'm coming up with right now. 
Thanks. But again, every long rope has an end, and I'm sure that the end is coming soon. Thanks, Sonia. Anil, I, I would ask that you, you maybe wrap up on this note. Um, you started off or earlier in your discussion to mention the fact that Guyanese, uh, the patience of Guyanese is running thin. Um, what do you want to say to people, uh, to the Guyanese people, as we move forward um, with what is before us uh, currently? Let me speak first to the chairperson of GCO. Madam Justice Claudette Singh has enjoyed great goodwill. She has acted very slowly. And many people believe that the sloth in which she has acted has contributed to many of the delays which we are seeing manifesting itself or themselves. When this entire process in the court is completed, even if it has to go to the, G the CCJ, this matter comes back to GCO. That's where it comes back to, you know. And I don't know if Justice Singh is listening to me. The PPP has never asked Justice Singh for a favor, and we wish no favor from any quarter. We want Justice Singh to discharge the functions of her office effectively, efficiently, expediently, impartially, and fairly. All those are language expressed in the law attendant to the functions of GCOM. We are not asking for anything exceptional. But whatever discretion and latitude and indulgences that Justice Singh believes must be granted, well, they must be extinguished now. They have been granted and regranted, and every one of them have been abused, misused, and manipulated. And I speak here for every single Guyanese law-abiding Guyanese I know. I speak to them. I feel their sentiments. I feel their anguish. I feel their pain. So I hope that Justice Singh, when this court matter comes back again, and it, it's ended and is dismissed, because that is the only outcome of it, that we don't have another long painful ordeal of Justice Singh giving this one a chance and that one a chance. If the results can't come in within the next two hours after the direction is given, then the person to whom that direction is given must be dismissed and another person appointed and given the direction to do it in an hour. And if there is a failure, well, then the commission should declare the results. And we will deal with it after that. But there is no two, three ways anymore, and there is no more room for dilation and delay. All, everything has been granted already. All the excuses and the, the, the fairness that people want, all of that finish. We have to come to the end of the road and G come no matter where we go, no matter which international organization intervenes. No matter which diplomat intervene, no matter how many statements come from wherever part of the world, the matter is a GCOM and it has to be concluded a GCOM. And Justice Singh must discharge that responsibility with the speed that is now required. All delays and detention have gone. We can't afford that anymore. And those are my closing remarks and sentiments. Anil Nandilal, uh, former Attorney General and candidate for the People's Progressive Party Civic, and uh, Sonia Farad, Attorney at Law, and also a candidate for the People's Progressive Party Civic. I want to thank both of you for joining me uh, this evening. As we thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the elections um, situation. And to our viewers, we want to say thanks for being part of the program.
you all have a good rest of the evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.